So, hello everyone. We are from Angry Demon Studio here in Skövde, and today we're going to talk a little bit about budget 3D scanning for video games. So, really quick, who are we? I am Victor Johnson, and I am an environment artist at Angry Demon, and with me today I have my friend and colleague John Calderon, who's the character artist and game designer at the studio. I'm sorry if I'm looking down a little bit. I need some words to start, because I'm this is the first time that I do something like this. <clears throat> so, I'm not going to talk any more, more about ourselves. Just let's get to do scanning stuff. Um, so, more specifically, we want to talk about today is photogrammetry, as it's called. So, what is that? Well, photogrammetry is the science behind making measurements from photos and is used today in geology, archaeology, engineering, movies, and of course video games now. Though they change a lot on how they actually works, so to speak. But before I actually do an example of how I would use this in making an environment prop, I'm just going to do a little overview how this is going to work. So we start with using some raw scan data, that is photos, that is then uh, pumped into a program that creates a point cloud, and that is the 3D photo scanning software. And then what we get out from that, it is a mesh and textures that we can use in our games. So that's just a very broad stroke thing, but I'm now going to have a more in-depth look on how we, this actually works. So where do we start? Yes, we need some ingredients actually before we start making things. So what do you need to start do photo scanning? First of all, you need a camera. And today, you can actually use maybe your phone camera, if it's a new phone, because they have really nice cameras nowadays. But the best thing would be if you can get a DSLR camera from somewhere. Maybe you can borrow it. Maybe you have one since before. Because, well, it's easier to set your settings. And of course, you get bigger and better photos, probably. Um, other than that, you will, of course, need a photo scan program or software. And today, we're going to talk about Reality Capture, because that's the only one we have used. And it's one of the more up and coming softwares on the market right now. Over than that, <laughs> other than that, you will also need, of course, your regular 3D software like Maya and ZBrush to do cleanup and UV mapping. And hopefully, you already have these things if you're here and are interested in doing 3D things. Right. Now that we have some stuff, it's time to go. Soon. We also need to wait, actually, <laughs> if we're going to do some scanning outside. It's not so easy to take photos any day of the week when you do photo scanning. Because when there's sharp light outside, you will have a lot of problems with your photos and you will have to do a lot of extra work to actually get something out from what you're doing. So it's best to wait for a light overcast day that gives you diffuse lighting. And if you've uh, ever before made photoing textures before, uh, this might sound a little bit familiar to you. So it's mostly to just get no sharp, hard shadows and just a little bit of ambient light. So you get a pretty flat scene when you take photos. This will help us, as I said before, to do less work on every images later. Anyway, when we find a good day that it's also not raining, because that's hard and boring, <laughs> uh, we have to go out into the forest or whatever you want to do. And for this example, I found this log laying out in the forest. It was, first of all, laying in a field of grass and leaves and stuff. So I had to move it, because stuff like that is really hard to capture if you don't intend to just capture that. So I put it here in a, on a little path that I found to get a more clear scan that I can actually use. So now when we actually have our thing and we can start shooting, we should first go through some small things that you should think about. So don't stand too close when you take your photos, and don't stand too far away. And that's really hard. What do you mean by that? Well, try to get your whole object that you want to scan in every image of the first set of images that you take. We can later take uh, what is called detail shots, which is more zoomed-in images at what you are trying to scan. But first of all, we actually need 
the array of images around the object to get something to work with that the program can actually use to find these measurements that I talked before. This is all to make things actually work, pretty much. And as I said there, we're actually going to move in a circle around our thing. So move in very small increments around 5 to 10 degrees. And you're like, what? Is that like 150 images for a log or something? Yes. You're going to take a lot of photos. And don't be lazy. Take a lot of photos. These programs are not picky. You could easily pump in 1,000 photos, and it would probably be fine, and you would get a really nice result. But that will take you some time. Anyway, so like many people in here, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not a photographer, but we also need to go through some quick camera settings on what we actually want to do. So we want nice, clear images when we do photo scanning, because we want to get all the details we can get of every scan. So no blur photos, no noise, and a lot of detail, of course. And there are some things here, and I'm going to skip them over, because you could actually go look this up later on photo scanning software websites. That's probably better for you. And it changes a lot from hardware to hardware what you're actually going to use. But you know, I hope you understand with no blur, no noise. Just clear images. That's all you need. Anyway, that's it. You took your 150 photos, and now it's just to pump them into your program and push buttons. And my, maybe you're like, it's not pushing buttons. I push three buttons in this program to make this log. That's how easy it is to actually make things. So the first button is just to align the images. And as you can see here in the picture, that's the cam that's just photos that I've taken without any data more than it's just a photo. The program itself aligns them in a 3D space and creates what is called the point cloud that I talked about in the beginning. And that's just a volumetric representation of a mesh, so to speak. With this point cloud, they can pr the program can later generate a high density mesh that we can do whatever we want with later. It's your high poly mesh pretty much. And of course, it also projects our color data. So we get the base color, or albedo, base that we actually need to do some tweaking with, because it still has ambient occlusion shadows in it that we can bake, so we can remove them again. It's things uh, that I hope you can pretty much understand, if you're also done baking any time in your life, too. It's not that hard. Anyway, that's it. I just do some cleanup because we need a low poly too. So I clean it first up in ZBrush, and then I send it over to Maya and do some more closer up cleaning and, of course, the UV mapping. And as you can see here, already, I've just baked the things, and that's how it pretty much looks. Pretty good. So we're kind of done. Just one small thing. When we bake, we get a lot of detail, of course, and that's cool. But as an environment artist, you know probably that using 4K maps or 2K maps for a log, that's pretty crazy. So of course, we need to do some small, what we're going to call it, optimizations. To, I actually have these things work for you. So use a lot of detail maps, as it's called. And what is that, you ask, maybe? That is tiling normal roughness and color maps that you can use to fake more detail in your scans. The far left image here is just a 512 512 of a scan tree, I think. And you see it's pretty blurry, but it has some base information there. Uh, in the middle, you actually have a, the same, but with three detail maps, two normal maps, and one roughness map. And as you can see, it already looks a lot better and more realistic than before. And to the far right, you also have the raw 8K scan that you would probably never use in a game ever. But as you can see, there's a small difference with really tiny details, but we get a really close result to what we actually want. So that's it. That's how fast it is. I'm sorry if it got very quick there. But if you have more questions later, I can talk about them. But I'm going to leave it over to my friend and colleague, John, to talk a little bit more about characters. Thank you very much. I'm going to need that computer as well. Yeah. <coughs> 
let's see here. All right, so Victor here is our environment artist and he does all the environments and I focus more on the character aspect of the game. So I'm gonna be talking about my pipeline for creating characters through photogrammet photogrammetry, that's a really hard word, uh, on a rather small budget for a, for a game studio. Uh, these are some of the results I want to show them first. So these are the things that I specifically uh, are going to talk about. So first off, as a character artist, most of the time you get a 2D concept from the 2D team. So uh, you have to follow this one. So you can't just go out there and scan anyone and be like, hey, you know what, I'm done. You still have to follow the concept that's um, approved by designers and writers and so on. So I'm just gonna use the raw data from one of my scans. Uh, the second thing that I want everyone to know is that basic tutorial knowledge will be left out. I won't be talking about specific things that you can just go to Google and, and find it, or YouTube and find it, because uh, that'll take, that's like a workshop and it takes a million hours. I'm just going to talk about my pipeline and general uh, like guidelines. Um, so this is more a technical talk than a workshop. All right, so I've decided to use photogrammetry. Now what? All right, first off, just as Victor said, you need a camera. And you need the camera that Victor described, the one where you can actually uh, like type in, you can get the ISO settings and so on. And the second thing that's unique to characters is you need a subject, a live subject, and he's actually here today. So he's actually, he does, he does exist. And <laughs> the third thing, the thing you can see on, on the farthest right there, is you need a 3D scanning studio. And that is, uh, to us, it's the outdoors. And what you see there, uh, it's a bunch of boxes that I tape together to hold my my subject still while they're, while they're being scanned, because they have to be perfectly still. So that's my 3D scanning studio on a budget. So, you know, if you have boxes, you, you're set. All right, so some quick advice for when you're actually starting to scan people, all right? Do it quickly. Just look at, look at anyone, and they move slightly, slightly all the time. That means that, you know, the slightest movement will mess up the photogrammetry data, which will get you a result that you don't want. So you have to do it click quickly. The closer you are, the better it will be. The more detail you will get in the shots. Uh, just as Victor described, small increments, small movements, so, so the program, the software can calculate properly. And a little thing that I discovered uh, a while back was first, I started taking pictures from the front and I went around uh, the subject. This posed a little problem because when he moved a little bit, the, the software calculated the left side of the face and when I got to the other side, it calculated the right side of the face, meaning that his face was askew. Uh, so I started scanning from his right ear, so I got his profile because I don't mind if his neck gets a little bit askew. So you have to like check out what is important to my scan, the face. All right, I have to make sure that I get the face in one take. Uh, the <laughs> second thing, uh, or, or not the second thing, but one thing that you really need to think about is the result, the final result. What do I want from this, all right? So I post my subject in a rather awkward pose with his mouth slightly open, uh, but not too open because I want the jawline. But at the same time, I want an open mouth so I can sculpt like a hole where the teeth and tongue is supposed to be. Because if his mouth is shut, that will pose a problem when I start cleaning up and making the actual character. And also bring an outfit for a severe workout. Uh, I, uh, my subject gets to kneel, because standing up, he will move around a lot. So he gets to kneel and I have to be in the same level as him. So I have to walk around him like a crab. Uh, so it's quite sweaty work. All right, this is uh, the, the scary result of the color map that you get out of it. So, and now what? What do I do next? I got my subject, I got my camera. All right, I took my pictures, I got a bunch of pictures. What do I do with them now? All right, the first thing you do is you need to make sure that your pictures are good. And we use Adobe Lightroom. Yeah, Adobe Lightroom. Uh, you fix up the photos, you fix the contrast, you fix the, fix the brightness, you fix some of the saturation uh, to make the subject pop out of the background. Because if the, if the subject kind of flows into the background, the software can't actually get any good data out of it, all right? So 
uh, you fix all the pictures um, in like in one go in Adobe Lightroom, and then you run it through your chosen software, whichever you use, and we use Reality Capture, uh, and it calculates. And this is the result you can get. If you do all the, if you take good pictures, you wait for a, for a good day, uh, this is the result. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of cleanup. It's not, it's not even close to being done, and it's not even close to the concept yet. So it's cleanup time. Yay, the fun part of being a 3D artist, all right? So yeah, so first you have to clean the sculpt. You, like, you clean up all the weird noise in the actual thing, in, in the bust. And when you've cleaned it up, and you, you're like, yeah, I, I, it's, uh, all the artifacts are gone. Uh, it's time to z remesh it. You create like a completely new version because uh, the version that comes out of the 3D scan, the topology for all the 3D artists out there is crazy. You can't subdivide it, you can't sculpt it. So you have to make something else and project it onto it. And that, there are tons of tutorials for that online, so don't worry about it. Um, and when you uh, when you've projected it and you have like a copy with good, a good mesh, with a good clean mesh that you can actually start sculpting on, you just UV map it in ZBrush so you can, you can project the color data from the software uh, so you can actually start you know, using it for something. And uh, that's what you can see there in the middle there. That's the, uh, that's the uh, projected color onto uh, a UV mapped mesh. So it's flat. So now I have the color information while I'm sculpting. And that's actually quite a good thing, because if you, if you have the data, you can add the color data, you can see on the mesh, all right, so here's a crevice that the capture didn't get, all right, so here's some wrinkles, and so on and so forth. And the last advice that I want to give you on like the color data, it's shadows and highlights in Photoshop to flatten the image, because you want a flat image. You can't have the lights, you can't have the shadows in your, in your finished character in the game, because that, that will make a lot of problems. It has to be completely flat. And there are plenty of tutorials for that as well. All right, so now we have the color data, we have the mesh that we can actually sculpt, and we have the raw data, and so on. What's next? It's detailing the sculpt. It's making like, you know, you start, you actually start manually sculpting the ears and you manually start sculpting eye, eye holes and lids and, and so on and so forth. And one thing that I discovered was that was quite amazing actually, is that if you take the flattened color data and you make it, uh, you create a height map from it. And anybody who's not familiar with a height map, it's pretty much like a map telling you plus minus in height. Uh, Google it. <laughs> uh, and you can actually project that onto the mesh in ZBrush. There are tutorials for, tutorials for this. That means that you can actually see in Photoshop where all the crevices and all the like, wrinkles are, and you can just project it onto the high poly mesh, mesh in ZBrush so you don't have to sculpt all the miniature wrinkles that create like a realistic feature. So, uh, the other thing uh, on this particular, in this particular place is, uh, you know, it's, it's sculpting the features. And as you can see here, I started changing my, uh, my subject. I, make my, I made him like malnourished. I made him thinner. Uh, I gave him bags under his eyes, something that does not match at all uh, the, the, pro the real subject. So, as I mentioned, I used the map to project the details. And as you can see in the middle there, you can actually see his tank top protruding down there. But that's okay, because I didn't want to use it. So, that's what happens when you, when you project it. And that's the finished bust to the right in ZBrush. That's the high poly mesh. So, we've done the high poly thing. And we actually have, actually have a height map and color data at the si same time as we finish the actual sculpt. Which, as a 3D artist, that's, that's like amazing to me, at least. All right, so that was super fun, right? We made a sculpt. So now what? Now we have to, there's still a long way to go, and we have to create the character, the actual, like the other parts of the character. And I used, uh, I'm just going to go quickly here, with Marvelous Designer cr to create the, the high poly clothing, which is an amazing software for clothing. And then it was the retopology, you know, the retopology uh, 
part of it. Uh, Victor talked a little, bit, a little bit about it himself, and you can just Google that as well and use your preferred software to retopologize for games. So make a game-ready character, uh, create the final UVs, and uh, the last thing is you have to like put them together because it's made out of pieces, as you can see. The hands, we also 3D scan the hands. Uh, the, ha the head is a separate piece and the body is a separate piece and you put them together. And to your right there, you can actually see the first result in Unreal Engine. So we're starting to get somewhere, but we're still not close to the actual character. So we've done the 3D scanning, we used it to create like a high poly and get the albedo and so on. Uh, but now it's time to finalize the character. So I gave him a beard and some hair cards to actually make him, you know, more live. <laughs> uh, so, um, excuse me. <coughs> uh, so. As I mentioned before, like it, you, you get the, the high poly sculpt and then you just create the game ready character. And these are the results. Well, and how, what about it? What about the technology? What's so budget about it, right? Uh, so to the bare basics, I can see personally that there are four budget levels of photogrammetry pretty much when you look around the internet. The large studio, a large 3D scanning studio is about 20,000 euros. And if you have a lot of money, that's really nice. You, you want the big one, get the big one. <laughs> but we can't afford it. So if you want to take it one step further down, it's a do-it-yourself studio. You buy like, a, um, you can buy certain things to hold cameras and you have to buy all the cameras because you need several cameras for a studio. And uh, we're going to talk about the pros and cons later about having several cameras versus the one camera that we're using. Uh, we have our method, which is about a thousand euros, about, and it's pretty much 800 euros ZBrush and 200 euros other things. Uh, so it's ZBrush, it's Maya for us. You can use other uh, 3D software for retopology re and UVs and so forth. Uh, the DSLR camera uh, and uh, the scanning software, pretty much. That's our method. But, of course, there's also free methods. So if you want to just go home today and try out photo scanning without like burning through a bunch of cash, uh, you can try the free options. And there are, you can use your phone camera. Well, you can use your phone camera if you have the correct settings, or else it will be very hard for you. Uh, you can just go to any tutorial on YouTube and check out like uh, photogrammetry with your phone. And they'll probably tell you about the settings that Victor talked about in the beginning of this presentation. Uh, there is open source scanning software, or free scanning software. And we've seen uh, in our research that there's like a software called Meshroom. Uh, we've never used it ourselves, so uh, use it on your own risk or find anything else that's free. Uh, but there is one. And you can use like free sculpting and retopologizing and UV software, like for example, Blender. Um, so there, there is a free alternative. But, how, however, a big however on that one, is like the more expensive the studio gets, the better the result gets and the less cleanup you need and the better the result gets, pretty much. Uh, so we still have to like deal with a lot of cleanup. Uh, I, as a character artist, I have to know my anatomy for scanning the hands. Because uh, a lot of the most important parts, like the knuckles and so forth, it probably won't appear. So I have to sculpt that uh, by hand. So if you compare it, just the thing I did, if I compare photogrammetry with like manual labor, like something I just made completely from scratch, the first thing, and this is in my opinion, that's very important to know, this is in my, in my opinion. So the pros for photogrammetry, photogrammetry is that you can go from expensive to free. So you can like put as much money as you want into it, but you can create it for, for free. Uh, it's also flexible. So we scan different things. We, we scan tree trunks, we scan characters, we scan everything that we want. Uh, and you know, and that's a big aspect of it, do it yourself. I like to do things myself. I don't want another studio to do it. It feels good to create something yourself. <laughs> so that's like, a, that's like a little opinion of mine. And the, mo the two most important things to the pros of photogrammetry is the result is better. 
Uh, I don't have any comparisons right now because it's really hard to compare. But I got a better result. I got so I got smaller details that made my sculptures so much more realistic in comparison to when I just created it by hand by looking at uh, reference photographies. And <laughs> the last thing is that it saves time. Uh, right before th uh, this character that I 3D scanned, I used, uh, I, I actually scanned, uh, not scanned, I sculpted a face for our main character and, and a body, and that took two weeks. The character you saw in the speech, and you soon will see again, that took three days. It took three days to get the high poly in comparison to the two weeks it took me to sculpt the high poly and make it really good. So that's like a big thing, and that's why I'm still going, uh, we're still going to use photogrammetry. Yeah. It saves a lot of time, uh, at least when you're working with the, when you're aiming for a certain degree of realism, of course. There are big cons to photogrammetry, though. Uh, it's still a lot of work. You still need to know your anatomy. You still need to know ZBrush. You still need to know, or the sculpting software. You still need to know all the software, and you need kind of a, a little bit of experience from sculpting manually. So it's still a lot of work. And as Victor mentioned before, you have to wait for perfect weather conditions if you don't have a studio with the perfect ambient light. So it was like, we need a new scan. We'll just have to wait for a, a cloudy day. When's that? In two weeks. I don't know. <laughs> So that can, for a, for, a, like a, for a tight schedule, you can't be like, hey, can I get that character? Oh, we just have to wait for a cloudy day. I don't, I don't think any producer will accept that. Uh, the third thing is that you can't know the result of the actual scan until you've done the calculation. And you can't complete existing uh, pictures, a picture set. So if you take your subject, you scan them, and you get back to the office, you do the whole thing with Adobe Lightroom and all that, and you see that the result is bad. And now it's night. OK, now I have to wait for another cloudy day. And <laughs> so uh, you can't actually see the result, and you can't complete them afterwards. You have to get the good result in one sitting when using the budget method, of course, by doing the spinning around with one camera. If you have a studio, that's not a problem. Uh, the last thing that I discovered, and any artist using a lot of software will probably agree with me on this one, but the more software you use and the more software that needs to communicate with each other, the more technical difficulties there will be. So when you start sending the meshes back and forth between different softwares, and boom, the mesh like vanished or flipped or something happened and you don't know where in the pipeline. Now that's a problem. So that's a bit about, first off, Victor talked about the photogrammetry for environments. And I talked about some of the photogrammetry uh, f of the f to make characters. and. Uh, uh, you are welcome. We have a booth here, and you can just come over there, uh, as well as these questions that we'll have right now. You can come over there and, and talk to us, and we can show other. We can show it in game. We can show other results. So let's open up for questions. Yes, of course. Wow, this is that. There's one. Uh, let's try this. Uh, when would you not use photogrammetry? When would you rather use like the classic method of building a high poly, low poly, and so on, or a base mesh instead? Well, it's if it's completely imaginary. If it's like 100% imaginary, like there's not even something that's close to it. Uh, I would say that's one of them. Like when you do sci-fi or a monster, for example. You could, if you prefer to do manual hand sculpting with clay, you could actually scan that, but... Why would you really? <laughs> the, in that case, you could just do it in ZBrush anyway. Yeah. But, you know, mostly if you're something you don't actually need a base for, you should actually just do it the manual old way with sculpting it in your preferred software. And if you can sculpt it in like a few hours, if, you can ju if, I, if I want something and you can actually create it in a day, that will, that will probably be faster. Yeah. So that is just an experience question, and you have to just like, um, you have to analyze what, what you need to do and which is the fastest method, pretty much. Hey, um, 
there's one problem with scanning that I've seen, uh, seen before, and the problem is that if you have a perfect mesh, you need perfect animation. For example, uh, I saw some early stages of the game, Fight Night, uh, mm -hmm. which had really realistic boxers. Mm -hmm. and, and they basically said, it looks like a corpse with a robot inside. <laughs> um, so basically, you know, so you try to compensate by using mocap and stuff. What's your approach? Well, that is actually a very difficult subject. It is, it is as you said. Like if you if you put the bar on realism on 3D scanning, you you need like a good result from from the actual animations. Uh, so our approach at the moment is we're figuring that out. Uh, so we are trying to implement mocap, and we are uh, and we have our animator here, and you can actually talk with our animator because uh, she's at the booth today. So if you want, you can head over to our booth and talk to our animator straight away uh, how she approaches this kind of animation task. Uh, but it does put a lot of strain on the animation team. It, it does do that because you know it, you, you raise the bar with realism and so on. So it can easily end up just as you said there. It's a robot inside it. <laughs> um, we have been looking slightly into doing a our own mocap studio once, but we said yeah. probably no because you could probably use a Kinect to the mocap, but it kind of makeshift and it's mm -hmm. a little bit janky. So we said no about that. And um, we have a mocap studio here in Hovde that we can use a little bit. And other than that, if you would actually need mocap and you don't have a studio or anything, you could buy them online too with mocap libraries and use that for, like, for say, walking and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It would be a little bit harder if you actually want to do a cutscene, but it's a lot of fiddling around, I guess, about that. Uh, first of all, very good talk, interesting. And uh, secondly, I was wondering, how are you doing with uh, the clothing and the other accessories to the characters? Is it photogrammetry, or are you like hand sculpting the, the other parts of the characters as well, or do you use something like similar, which you take photos off and then import through your pipeline? How, how's your pipeline and approach to other parts of the character? Uh, so for this particular character that you see down here, uh, is uh, the, it's the face. It's only the head, uh, only the base of the head, so not the hair cards or anything, but just, and not the eyes or anything like that. Uh, that's uh, photo scanned, the hands are photo scanned, uh, but the body uh, I made completely by hand by using uh, Marvelous Designer and then uh, using ZBrush to uh, complete the result, and then I drew a low poly on top of it. Uh, so you can photo scan complete characters uh, if you have a proper studio. And that's actually a downside to the budget version of it, is that w it would be really nice. I saw like a leaked video on YouTube where uh, I think they did uh, photogrammetry for Resident Evil 7, and they uh, uh, it's the Jack character, the old man character. They actually put makeup on him and put his, I think, some clothes on him, and they scan the guy. So that's like one version of doing it. We like we like have uh, like we we kind of use raw data to create our characters instead of a complete scan, because I would love to just put somebody, like somebody, can, can you make an outfit for my guy and we put him in a booth and then it's done and just, I can just, you know, use that information. Uh, so uh, my approach to the character here is, uh, as I mentioned, it's 3D scan for, uh, for only the organic parts of the guy and the rest I had to do by hand. And if you thought it was a problem with, as John said, there is problems with scanning living characters because they move. Mm. Scanning cloth moves even more <laughs> when it's hanging, and that's what you actually want later, probably. Mm. That's the cool part with the yeah. dynamics and stuff like that. Yeah. And if you don't know really what Marvelous Designer is, it's, it's a physics-based clothing program or something, we're going to call it. Pretty much. It's really cool if mm. you look it up. It's mm. like sewing in real, li real life. It's really fun to... <laughs> yeah. and, and now that you actually mention it, uh, for some games you maybe want clothing that moves and maybe you want hair that you know can move in the wind and a uh, photo scanned material as far as I know it's uh, sometimes you know it's uh, f for those particular kind of technical things you might want to do it from scratch but you know maybe that's just something everybody has to figure <laughs> some somebody has to figure out <laughs> I saw someone have a question here before, if some, or was it? You? Yeah. 
Yeah, I missed the first minutes, but uh, do you have, like for trees with leaves, uh, they don't, uh, when you have like uh, 3D scanning, they will uh, have a lot of jitter and noise if you have leaves and small details which are wet. I mean with wind and stuff, that it will move? Yeah. yeah. Yes, so as I really quickly mentioned, if you missed it, uh, I tried to move my subject or object into a open space, so I used this little path that I moved the log onto, because I actually do not want to capture a lot of overhanging leaves and grass, because that's really hard to capture when you're going to walk around in circles around this thing for half an hour or whatever. So it will move a lot. And that's really hard later for the program to capture. It becomes blobby and hard. So that's what stuff that I later cut out when I do my cleanup in ZBrush. So if you want that later, you should probably actually do a specific scan of the leaves and the grass and make specific meshes and add them later. So I would try to avoid that if I ever want to use it. Um, just a small question really on the software used, the 3D scanning software that you use. Um, I know that there's like, it was a while ago, but AgriSoft PhotoScan was the big one, I think. Um, What's the difference between the different programs, or have you tried any different programs except this one? Because I never heard of it before, actually. <laughs> so I did a little bit of research when we did this. And when we looked around, there is some bigger programs. So it's the, uh, a program from a company called Agisoft. And uh, as you said, the Microsoft one, right? Yes, I think they closed that down. You can. I think you can still get it. I'm not sure. Uh, there was some something about it, but we decided to take Reality Capture because we saw uh, the bigger studios like Quixel, who's here, use Reality Capture, and also for characters, we looked at the studio 1024. If you heard about them, they make pretty much all the cool characters you see in CG, uh, like cutscenes and trailers. So we were like, yes, this seems like to be the best software. As how these software differs, because I have not tried them, <laughs> anything other than reality capture, I can't really say. But as I understand, they all got the you know uh, alignment tools mostly, which is your favorite one, because it will be super fun if you want to have to do that manually. But they can mostly do things the same way, probably. There's very little differences. It's mostly the quality and the speed of the programs themselves. Hence also why we use Reality Capture, because it's really, really fast for making really high density meshes. Cool, it doesn't seem like we have any more questions. Brilliant, cool. Uh, there's one thing that I want to add before we end this, and it's that this pipeline is something that we made. So this is, or we got different sources, we did research online. So the software we're using, the methods we're using, so do not like take them as a literal, this is the best thing. Because uh, uh, we might be, you know, we're just doing our best, trying to make good results. Uh, so uh, go, if you're interested in this, just go out there, start searching for your own, which software do I want to use? How much money do I want to put into it? Uh, what kind of equipment do I want to use? And, uh, and so on and so forth. So just so everybody knows it, don't take this too literal. There's, there's millions of different uh, pipelines and tips out there, and this is just one of them. Cool, and if there's no more questions, uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. It was super fun.